Well, welcome. Thanks for joining us today for our online service at the Neighborhood Church. Uh, we're going to have a good time today. We're going to be worshiping together. We're going to be getting into our series, Teach Us to Pray, and we're going to be taking communion. So if you're joining us online, I just encourage you to get a piece of bread, maybe a cup of juice set aside, and join us as we take communion. Let's head into the auditorium as worship is going on right now.
we're going to get into our memory verse that we've chosen for this month that goes along with our sermon series, Teach Us to Pray. It's found in Matthew 6, and here it is. Pray like this, our Father in heaven, may your name be kept holy. May your kingdom come soon. May your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today the food we need, Matthew 6, verses 9 to 11. And so we just want to encourage you just to memorize that throughout this month and just get that hidden in your heart. Ways to give are coming up on the screen, and uh, we just want to thank you for your giving at the Neighborhood Church. It is Fall Missions Month here going on right now, our missions emphasis for the fall. And so we just want to encourage you to consider that in your giving. And just uh, if you feel led to give to missions, we encourage you to do so and just mark missions on your giving or your envelope. A few announcements, just some family news I want to share. Christmas banquet is coming up. That's Friday, December 2nd at 6 p.m. Doors open at 5.30. Tickets are $27.50 per person. There's also a uh, event for kids happening that evening. It's a pajama party for ages 1 to 10, and for registration, that's $5 each for them. It's going to be a good time. There's going to be a catered turkey dinner. There's going to be musical guests. Uh, if you want to get in the holiday spirit and join some members of your church community, sign up. Invite your friends. Invite those who normally don't attend. Bring some people out, and uh, it's going to be a good time to come together for our Christmas banquet. Sister Life is happening Monday, November 28th at 6.30 p.m. Register online at the Sister Life Facebook page. There's going to be free child care that evening. All ladies are welcome. There's a special guest speaker. It's just such a good time to come together. I've heard so many positive reports about Sister Life, so I just want to encourage you for all the ladies, make sure to sign up for that and make that a part of your week. Also, neighborhood groups are in are in full swing, I guess I could say it like that. And we're just gonna promo a couple of groups on Friday night, 7 p.m. There's a Bible study led, led by Stephen and Angelica Enns. And uh, that's a group for young adults. And so if you wanna go deeper in the scriptures, deeper in the word, and you wanna connect with others, that might be for you. So feel free to register um, either here at the church or phone us, email us, let us know. We'd love to connect you with that group. Also Thursday night, 7 p.m. Uh, there's a young adult group also led by Ashley Drayton that's here at the Pine House venue and they come together. It's a great time and so I just encourage you be a part of that. It'll be awesome. You'll be glad you did. At this point, let's go back into the auditorium and uh, Chelsea's going to continue to lead us.
gather around the bread and the cup. If you're here this evening and on your way in you did not receive the communion packet, just uh, raise your hand even now. Our ushers will come forward and if you want to partake with us, make sure you get them. Anybody, anybody needing? Why do we, uh, why do we do communion? What's this about? What's the reason for eating together and drinking together? I think communion is designed by God to sustain the life of the church. Communion is designed by God to sustain the life of the church. This is a weekend of prayer and fasting. I delight to see our church participating in that and excited about it. But when you fast and pray, one thing you become very aware of is, boy, I'm weak. Boy, I'm weak. I was climbing up and down some stairs today a number of times, and by about the sixth trip up, I'm thinking, oh, this is terribly hard work. Why? Because I didn't receive the normal sustenance that we need for physical life. We eat bread, we drink, we keep our liquid levels up. We eat to maintain the sustenance of our physical body. And the Lord designs communion to maintain the life, the sustenance of the church. Because if the church ever gets its eyes off of Jesus, it's going to begin to die. And so communion calls us back over and over again to remember him. To remember him, it maintains the life of the church. The life of the church is in keeping our eyes on Jesus. It's in keeping at the forefront the realization that Jesus came to earth, came to earth to take upon himself our sins. He died for you. He died for me. He's buried and on the third day rose triumphant. We do this in remembrance of him. Remembering him maintains the life of the church. And so now, in remembrance of him, I ask you to peel back the cellophane level of this packet and take the bread. In remembrance of him, I ask you to break it. And then in remembrance of him, remembering his broken body, broken for us, broken for you, broken for me. In remembrance, let us eat together. I'll just get you to open up your packet here for the cup. And in remembrance of Jesus, in remembrance of his blood that was shed for us so that our sins could be forgiven. This has implications for us on our past, on our present, and on our future, as we will be with him forever. And so um, it's a real meaningful time as we look to Jesus, as we look to the blood that was shed so that you and I could be forgiven. Let's partake of the cup today together. Hallelujah. With much thanksgiving, remembering Jesus, let's worship together. In prepping for this week, I was, God brought me this, these psalms. And um, here you go. Psalms 51, 16 to 17. 
you do not desire a sacrifice or I would offer one. You do not want a burnt offering. The sacrifice you desire is a broken spirit. You will not reject a broken and repentant heart, O oh God. And then Psalm 141. Accept my prayer as incense offered to you and my upraised hands as an evening offering. Take control of what I say, O oh Lord, and guard my lips. I think it's so easy to think of incense as being the smelly stuff that personally I don't like. Um, but I love that David turns it around there and is like, accept us, accept our offering as meager as it is. And um, so let's let's offer let's offer up our sacrifice here. Okay. Day and 
continue our series, uh, Teach Us How to Pray. We're going to be in Luke 11, um, Luke 11, 1 to 4 today. So if you want to get there, you can uh, with your electronic device, your Bible. If not, it's going to be up on the screen. And we are going to look at this scripture like we have been up until this point through the series as an aspect of how to pray it as prayer. We're going to continue talking about prayer. Prayer is the most essential part of the Christian life. What is prayer? Basically, without going into tons of detail, prayer is talking to God. That is what prayer is. And a lot of people are confused or they feel weird about prayer. Or some of you might say, oh, well, I talk to him all the time, but I don't ever hear back. So I'm going to settle something from the very beginning that's going to be really hard for you to hear right here, right now. It's not about you hearing from God. Although that happens, it's not about you. It's about God hearing from you. It's about him. So I'm going to start today with a little fun story. There's a mother. She takes her three-year-old grocery shopping. And before they go into the store, the mother says, you need to listen to me. Don't ask for chocolate chip cookies. Because I'm not going to buy you chocolate chip cookies no matter what. Is that clear? And the little boy says, yep. So she puts him into the shopping cart. They go into the store. And he's doing really well. But unfortunately, mom has to go down that cookie aisle. So the little guy stands up in his cart and says, mom, can I please have those chocolate chip cookies? And she says, I told you before I came into the store, don't ask me for chocolate chip cookies because you're not going to get any chocolate chip cookies. So the little guy sits back down in the cart. They're going through the store again. He's doing quite well. But unfortunately, she's got to go past that cookie aisle again. So she heads down that same aisle. The little three-year-old stands in the cart and just a little bit louder says, Mom, please, can I have chocolate chip cookies? And of course, she says, no, I told you several times you're not going to get any chocolate chip cookies. So they finish their shopping. They go up to the checkout. The little guy's kind of looking around, probably thinking, okay, like, this is my last chance. This is my last chance to plea and get my chocolate chip cookies. And so he stands up in his shopping cart and yells as loud as his little three-year-old voice can go and says, in the name of Jesus, may I have some chocolate chip cookies? And so, of course, now everyone's laughing at the registers. There's even a couple people who are clapping. And because of the generosity of those shoppers, that little boy left with 23 boxes of chocolate chip cookies. So why do I tell you this cute story? You know, some Christians think that prayer is the Christian way of filling up their shopping cart. You know, you've got to say it in a certain way. There's like Christian formulas in prayer. You've got to say it this way or repeat it so many times. I mean, there's formulas out there. And then there's others that get these crazy ideas or they think or they say if they don't go to church a couple times a week, if they don't do this, they don't do that, that he won't hear your prayers. So they've made these formulas that they use various things to do to fill up their Christian cart. Or they try to fill that cart with things that they think they need, like those chocolate chip cookies, and not with what God knows that you need. And I think all of us this morning, regardless of where you are in your faith, whether you're a new believer or you've been doing this for 40 years, and I confess the need for this instruction too. I'll always need instruction on prayer. I will always want to learn more about prayer. 
And so we're going to look to the example of Jesus, which is what we've been doing in these past weeks in this sermon series, this Teach Us to Pray. So if you haven't been following along, you can catch up on YouTube if you want to go back, because I'll just kind of highlight some things as we go. But I think what we have before us in scripture today, which is commonly called the Lord's Prayer, is these priorities and patterns of prayer that then become our desire. So could you imagine what effect that this would have on our lives, on our marriages, upon our families, upon our relationships? Can you imagine if we actually implemented this pattern, how it would affect life on the job? How it would affect life in your neighborhood, in your church? Could you imagine what this prayer could do if you began to pray for the unsaved? We would start to pray for our wrong attitudes. We would pray for God's will. We would pray to advance the kingdom. We would want to honor God. Could you imagine if this was part of each of our prayer every single day? What a difference it would make. And as we want to study prayer, right? Prayer is important, right? This is why we are studying it. So listen to this quote by Craig Rochelle. He's a lead pastor of the Life Church, which I think this says it really well. Prayer reminds us we are not in control and keeps us close to the one who is. What I want you to see today is a facet of prayer that I know from my own experience. What God has taught me the most about prayer. And it's this desire to pray. There's two particular situations, circumstances that come to mind in my life. And one was a prayer meeting with believers. I hadn't been to very many of these before, so I was super uncomfortable when I first came. But this prayer changed me. This was really when things shifted for me. I remember we were sitting there. There was just in a small room. There was a circle of about 20 to 30 of us. And they were going to begin to pray. And they started by sharing testimonies about what God was doing in their lives. And then one individual just stood up and he said, we need to pray. And all of a sudden, he fell down on his knees and his face to the floor. And he began to weep. I've never seen this before. Just audibly weeping out loud before the Lord. And for the next hour, everybody in that room was praying out loud or weeping. And they weren't praying things that I couldn't understand, like I thought at that time that you needed to do. They were saying things like, God, thank you for not forgetting about us. God, you're so good and you're so holy. God, thank you for loving us. Thank you for being our father. God, thank you for knowing each of us by name. And for an hour, this went on, nonstop, just weeping before him and calling out to him. And there is no exaggeration here, because I know we like to exaggerate, but when we got up off the floor, because I did too, there were literally tear marks over people's t-shirts. That is how much they were weeping and crying from people who were so passionate about God in prayer. And then the other situation, circumstance that comes to mind was here in a worship service, a prayer time. And there was a lady who was going through an awful time. She'd lost her daughter. She was about to lose her house. It's just everything was falling apart. But she told me that she came here to call out to God and to worship him. So I prayed with her. And when we finished... She started dancing in worship. What causes you to pray like that? What causes you to fall on your face and just weep before the Lord? To let your prayer lead to dancing in the middle of life's storms and the most awful circumstances. How does that happen? I think it has something to do with our desire for God, our desire for prayer. And then based on those circumstances, which happened early in my faith, I began to study prayer. 
It was fascinating to me because God, in my story, in my testimony, met me on a hospital floor and I prayed for the first time. So prayer became so interesting to me and I wanted to see it. So I started to experience prayer in entirely new ways that I had never experienced before. And I believe that desire in prayer is all over scripture if you look for it. And so as we go through this series, as we wonder how to pray, I want us to begin with this. Make your wants God's wants. Your desires God desires. Desire what God desires. This is how intimacy is created. Intimacy is created by this unity of affection, right? When you and somebody else, anybody else, when the two of you long for the same things, you desire the same things and want the same things, it creates an intimacy between you and that person. And that's the way that it works with God. When we want what he wants, when we desire what he desires, the mystery of intimacy with God becomes a reality. And the things that are closest to God's heart becomes the things that are closest to your heart. We begin to want what God wants. So you see, it's not about praying this word for word, although there's nothing wrong with that, and I would even encourage it. It's this transformation of the heart. So if I can say it like this, it's not about saying or praying, saying or praying, our Father but discovering that he is your father. And you want to be with him. You want to spend time with him. You start to have real conversations with him. So let's look at Luke chapter 11, 1 to 4. For many of you, we've been here for a while, so you're going to see that. We've talked about verses 1 to 3 already. Um, And this is what Jesus said. He said to them, when you pray, say, Father, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, give us each day our daily bread, forgive us our sins, for we also forgive everyone who sins against us, and lead us not into temptation. So I'm going to review quickly the previous weeks, which is really important, I think, because I think you kind of see this progression in this prayer. So Father... We come to him as his children. We want to spend time with him. We want to organize our day, our week, our life to sit at the feet of the Father. And get this, Father God, the creator of the universe, he delights in you. He delights in that. Your prayers are an incense to our Father. I stumbled on this verse this week. It's David's prayer when he was in the cave from Psalm 142, just a small portion of it. With my voice, I cry out to the Lord. With my voice, I plead for mercy to the Lord. I pour out my complaints before him. I tell him my trouble before him. When my spirit faints within me, you know my way. He's your father. He wants us to bring it to him. So that he can lead us and show us the way. He just wants to spend time with you and delight in you. And then hallowed be your name. So this is our God. The name above all names. We place his name holy. His name is set apart. We are in awe of him. In awe and wonder of who he is. And we only got the opportunity to talk about a few names of God. Um, And you can um, actually mark your connection card if you would like to see how to pray the names of God. Pastor John is going to send that out. Um, But he is our peace, our protector, our strong tower, our healer, our shepherd, our righteousness, our banner, our refuge. He is the God Almighty. The one who we run to, the first place we run to. And then our kingdom come. Pastor John had pointed out that in the Greek, come came first. So come your kingdom over my life. Lead my life, Father. Control my life. Less of me, more of you. Take over my thoughts. Take over my life, my heart. Come your kingdom in my family. Come your kingdom in my church. Come your kingdom over new believers. And then whatever specific needs you have, come your kingdom over that. And to quote our lead pastor, he said, prayer is about being, bringing us to a place where we are submitting to God's will, not trying to convince God to submit to our will. 
And then give us our day, our daily bread. God is our provider. This means we go to him first for the things that we need. Our expectation is in God, in knowing who he is and knowing that he will provide. And I like how Pastor John said it. Go to him each day for the things of the day. And then we move in to today's prayer focus, verse 4. Forgive us our sins, for we also forgive everyone who sinned against us. Forgive us our sins. Four simple words that absolutely blow open the storehouse of heaven's mercy. Asking God for his grace. May we never lose sight of the beauty and the wonder of coming before the holy God of the universe and saying, forgive me. Forgive me, Father. I'm sorry, Father. I need you, Father. And then knowing that he hears us. What an incredible thought. See, forgiveness is not just a past event. Like, thank you, Jesus, for forgiving me for the crazy things I've done and so many times missing the mark. But it's an ongoing need in our lives. We keep asking it over and over, knowing and trusting that God hears us. Please don't pass over this part quickly. Don't go over it so quickly so you can move on to the next thing that you really want to ask God about. Let it soak in. Forgive us our sins. We want his grace. We ask for his grace. God, I need your grace. I'm going to share a parable with you, a story that Jesus shared to teach a lesson. The parable of the Pharisee and the tax collector. You'll find it in Luke 18, 9 to 14. To some who were confident of their own righteousness and looked down on everybody else, Jesus told this parable. Two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee stood by himself and prayed, God, I thank you that I am not like other people, like the robbers, the evildoers, the adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week and I give a tenth of all I get. But the tax collector stood at a distance. He would not even look up to heaven, but beat his breast and said, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. I tell you that this man, rather than the other, went home justified before God, for all those who exalt themselves will be humbled, and all those who humble themselves will be exalted. Now, we don't have time to go into this parable into detail, but we can see that prayer has something to do with humbling ourselves, something to do with the right attitude. None of us are righteous and can look down on others. And I love how Jesus is always shocking people all over scripture because this would have been a shock to this audience. The audience is likely expecting the Pharisee to be the prime example of what they should look like, right? After all, no one would have expected that the low-life tax collector who betrayed his own people for money was the prime example to follow. But I'm going to sum it up this way. The tax collector did not boast of his own righteousness, but pled with God for mercy, acknowledging his sin. He used God as the standard of righteousness. That's our standard of righteousness. And confessed that he fell short. He knew that his only hope was God's mercy. Whereas the Pharisee felt no need and voiced no petition, he even boasted of himself and looked down on others. And I'm convinced the more we walk with God in prayer, the more connected that we are hit with him in prayer, the more this will become a fundamental part of your praying. And I know you're probably thinking, well, that doesn't make sense. It should be the opposite. You'd think the closer we get to God in prayer, the less we'll need to ask for grace, the less we'll need to ask for forgiveness because we're going to be doing everything right. I think the opposite is true. In scripture and in my own personal experience, I think the deeper you go in your relationship with God and the deeper you walk with him in prayer, the more you become aware of your desperate need for his grace. And the more he exposes the things in your life that you never saw before, that you want to get rid of so that you can live the Christ life. We need his grace. So you experience forgiveness. Forgive us our sins. And we have the privilege in prayer of experiencing his forgiveness in the moment of praying 
to God, knowing that your sins are forgiven. This frees you. This is a gift. It frees us from living under condemnation of guilt. We get to experience forgiveness. This is not just some theoretical truth in the pages of scripture. This is a reality in your life and in prayer. Forgive us our sins. You experience his forgiveness and he looks at you and he says, not guilty. Slate wiped clean. Now, I don't know about you, but that's reason to pray. Don't you want that grace? Because he's ready to pour it out for you each and every day, each and every moment, each and every circumstance. Now, we experience his forgiveness in a couple ways. And I think just, you know, we're not here to talk just about forgiveness. But first of all, when you first come to know Jesus, you first repent and you accept him in your life. Okay? Then there's this continual picture that whenever you pray, you are to say, forgive us our sins. So this seems to imply or assume that we're going to always need to ask for this one, right? Like every single day, we're going to need to ask for it. It seems to assume that we're in constant need of forgiveness, that even our best work needs to be washed in the blood of Christ. Even the best things that you can bring to the table are filthy rags that he needs to cleanse with his righteousness. So we continually ask over and over and over, God, forgive me of this. God, forgive me of this. God, forgive me of that. And we know, church, you cannot exhaust the mercy of God. You just keep coming back to the well, and it'll keep covering you time and time and time again. You ask for his forgiveness continually, and then you experience his forgiveness specifically. There's a definite article, the sins. Forgive us of the sins that we have committed. It's a prayer here. It's not like just saying, God, I know I messed up somewhere, so I'm just going to cover my bases and say, forgive me for everything. And that should cover it. Now, there's prob- there is a point in your salvation where that's certainly the case, Okay. We come to God, we realize our sinful nature, we realize our need for him, and our whole life has been headed towards towards sin, and then we make this decision, this decisive, decisive trust in Christ, and he cleanses us of all those sins. But then, at that point on, now picture this from Luke 11, we're no longer coming forth to be judged and be declared guilty or innocent for all of eternity. Now, It's a picture of a child coming before Abba Father and saying, you know, I messed up, Dad. There's something that I have let come between us, and I'm specifically just going to get that out on the table. I'm laying it out there as if, like, he doesn't already know already like as if we can hide. But you come to the point where you say, God, I need you to forgive me for fill in the blank with your specific thing. And then you know, you know he hears you. And you fill in the blank with the sin that you would be ashamed for anybody else to hear. But he hears you and he forgives you specifically. He covers that sin with his righteousness. We can be specific with him. And we let God in through this, through prayer, and you let him take hold of those areas. Because I don't know about you, but when I get a cup, I don't want just the outside of the cup clean. I want the inside clean too. I don't want a clean cup on the outside and it all filthy in the inside. No, wash the whole thing. This, 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 and that. Sometimes we just need to camp out at this part for a little bit in the prayer and ask for his grace and hear him tell you over and over and over and over again that you are forgiven, that you are not guilty anymore, that you are not filthy anymore. And feel that. Experience that forgiveness and start to believe it. 
It's this daily reminder that we need his forgiveness when we go into our days, into our interactions with others. So just maybe, just maybe, we will actually be quick to forgive and less likely to judge and offer this grace and mercy and reflect reflect his light in the darkness of the world. And then it's not where this whole picture stops in Luke 11. Forgive us our sins. We need to extend his forgiveness. So for we also forgive everyone who sins against us. Now the danger here in Luke 11 is to think that what Jesus is saying is that it's based or the grounds for your forgiveness is in the actions towards others. And that's not what scripture teaches. The basis for our forgiveness is the grace and mercy of Jesus Christ. And trusting in Christ. So we ask him to forgive us based on that. But here's what Jesus is saying very clearly. If you can ask God to forgive you of your sin. And yet you're not going to forgive others around you. That unforgiveness is a sin. And so you really haven't asked God to forgive you of your sins. Unforgiveness, the root of bitterness and grudges and this desire for revenge that we hold on to in our workplaces, in our schools, on our teams, in our homes, in our churches, Jesus calls it out. It's sin because failure to forgive is a complete contradiction of the gospel that you have come to trust in. It's a complete contradiction of what you're asking God to do for you in prayer. And so he says, you have received my forgiveness, then you radiate my forgiveness, you show my forgiveness in a way that makes no sense to this world. That's what he goes as far to say. And then in Matthew 5, 23 to 24, he says this. So if you are offering your gift at the altar, and there remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift there before the altar and go. First be reconciled to your brother, and then come and offer your gift. See, if you come to prayer, you go to pray, and you realize that there's something between you and him, or you and a brother and sister, you need to go get that right, and then come back into prayer. Pastor John shared an article with me uh, this week, and there was this one portion that just Couldn't have said it better, so I'm going to share it with you. It's a sermon that was written in 2003 called Forgiveness and the Lord's Prayer. This is not all of it. This is just one significant chunk of it. Our real problem at this point is not theological. Our real problem is personal. We don't see ourselves as very great sinners. Therefore, we do not appreciate how greatly God has forgiven us. But when your own sin seems small, the sin of others against you seems big indeed. The reverse is also true. The greater you see the depth of your sin before God, the less the sins of other people against you will bother you. If you think you're not much of a sinner, then offenses of other people are going to appear in your eyes as big. Don't talk about repentance unless you are willing to forgive your brothers and sisters. Unless you are willing to forgive, your repentance is just so much hot air and empty talk. True repentance always starts with a change of mind that leads to a change of heart, that leads to a change, in this case, in the way we view those who have sinned against us. The worship team can start to come up. So the challenge for us in the room today to consider is what areas of bitterness are still there or hearts that are holding grudges or desires of revenge or whatever that might be. Unforgiveness in our lives and our relationships with each other, brothers, sisters, we have to go and get those right. We need to get those right. Now, this thing called confession We don't like it. We don't like that word. We don't like to camp out in this area. But I'm convinced that as God works in our family, our faith family, and he leads us deeper and deeper into his word and deeper and deeper into the mission, we will need more and more time in confession, not less. We will need more time to fall on our faces and weep, to dance 
in hard circumstances, corporately and individually, and saying, God, I need and I want your grace. And so over the next few minutes, that's what we're going to do. Again, the goal for this church is not just to be spectators, but to find ways to help us find and follow Jesus. Help us be the church. Help us in this series to learn how to pray. So as we go into worship and we examine our hearts and we respond to this message and we confess our need to him, we're going to pray over this room as individuals so you can do this in your head. You can do this out loud in your heart, whatever that looks like to you. God, forgive me of fill in the blank. Specific. What do you need his forgiveness for just right now in today in the last 24 hours? Be specific with God. Ask him to reveal things that maybe you're unaware of. He forgives us this whole picture that we've fallen short with this and this and that. And as your people, we're going to ask for his forgiveness and his mercy and his grace. And if there's anything you're holding on to, bitterness, unforgiveness, you need to go get that right. So whether it's the person that's right beside you and you need to say, hey, we got to get this right. Maybe it's somebody else. Maybe the result of praying today will make you go take care of it tonight, tomorrow. I want us to spend time here in confession and worship. And you can bow, you can stand, you can pray, you can sing along, you can stand, you can kneel. But let's just spend some time coming honestly before the throne of mercy and saying, forgive us, Father, of our sins. If you'll stand with me. God, we, we need you. Like, we desperately need you. We want your grace. We want you to pour it out on us, Father. Reveal the things that we need to confess, Father. The things that we're ashamed to say, Father. Let us bring those before you now. Bring the filth, our mistakes, our sin, our bad attitudes, our unforgiveness before you right now. And we know, Father, your grace is enough. Your power of your grace is just, I can't even comprehend it. We are all sinners in this room, and we need your grace. I pray that you give us such a strong desire for your grace that we would be honest with you in our sin, that it, we would draw us deeper and deeper towards yourself, and you would expose more and more of our need for your grace. So, Father, as we go into worship, I just say collectively that we trust you and that we need you, that you are our defense and our righteousness. Forgive us our sins, Father. Lord, we need you. In Jesus' name I pray.
us for our online service today. Our hope is that you are blessed by your time with us. Forgiveness is one of those things that each one of us wrestles with and struggles with and uh, the Lord has instructed us to make it a part of our prayer life. So I encourage you to do that. Thanks for being with us again. We've had church. Let's go be the church. God bless. Have a great week.